Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Wednesday night Bible study. We are here at Macedonia Church at 39 West Avenue. Today is Wednesday, August 28th, and we are excited to get into a lesson about Josiah, how he calls the people back to God. I am Annalisa Davis, and on behalf of our pastor, Brandon Jay Davis and the whole Macedonia family, we welcome you um, to our Bible study this evening and we ask that you share and just make yourself at home and let's all just stretch out and study the word of God together tonight. Um, we're going to open up with a brief word of prayer and then we're going to get started. Uh, Mother Millie, can you open us up in prayer? Yes. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you, and we thank you for life that you've given us on today. We thank you for this lesson that reminds us of our young pastor. We thank you for giving him in the heart. We thank you for giving him a love for your word. We thank you also, God, for the way you brought souls to the author on Saturday, on Sunday. We thank you for our visionary, L. Stevens, a complete healing in the name of Jesus. We thank you for that open door that we're gonna bring him through. We thank you for the vision of this church. We're just grateful, Lord, for what you've done. You've given us a, 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 a love in this church for each other. You've given us, you've knitted us together. And we thank you that anytime we need anybody we're there for each other. I just thank you for the prayers of the saints. When we get sick, the saints are there to pray. And I just am grateful for a good, healthy church. I thank you, Lord, that I saw Elder Dancy in the church. I saw Sister Tish in the church. And I just want to say, Lord, I thank you for healing. I thank you for complete healing. I, I just thank you for Anna. I thank you that you've given her a sharp mind. I thank you for illuminating her mind in this, uh, in this study of Josiah. I just thank you, Lord. We're so blessed. There's so many countries that don't have Bibles, but we have your Bible. We could open it. And we could read it any time of the day or night. And Lord, we just want to say thank you that we don't have to go through persecution when we open our Bibles or talk about you to anybody. I just thank you for your grace that you've put on America. I thank you for giving us continued boldness to tell people that don't know about you, to tell them about your love. Lord, I thank you for the message that came forth on Sunday, reminding us of your love. Thank you, God, that we won't take your love for granted, but we will be obedient to not only listening and hearing your word, but to live your word. Lord, we just thank you for this lesson. We ask that the participants join in together. As Anna said, we're family to learn one for another. There's no big U's or little I, whatever, however you say that, but everybody is the family. And we ask you, God, to continue and give us of your love so we could spread it. We thank you for Mother Rumble. We just thank you, God, how you're keeping her. Hallelujah. We thank you for keeping her. And we bless you, God, on tonight. You've been more than good. You've been better than good to us, Lord. Help us to go forth and just love on each other, pray for each other, and continue and encourage each other. Let your way be done. Let your will be done in this Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mother Millie, for that awesome prayer. So like Mother Millie said, um, how we love on each other and how, you know, um, we're, we're a very loving church and we stand by our pastor and one another. So just a little, um, yeah, a little small talk about the weekend. It was a great weekend services this weekend. We were, um, 
had a true surprise blessing with um, Pastor Davis uh, preaching to us Friday night, and he was talking about the recipe for revival. And what an awesome, timely message for everything that's going on in uh, America today, especially, and even the world. But he, you know, just the recipe of how to come back to God in Second Chronicles 7 and 14, and just if my people will turn from their wicked ways and pray. And it's an awesome message. If you haven't heard it, listen to it. If you have heard it, a refresher is always good. And then on Sunday, he came back with a plain and simple to the point message that Jesus loves us. He just loves us. That's that's all he preached about. And every time you get into the word and, and it seems like every time Pastor B gets up, he gives us another little nugget of his word and of, you know, of what God is saying and a little more illumination. So it was truly awesome. And then on Sunday, we also had um, the blessing of the children, you know, the children's dedication. And it wasn't just limited to infants or toddlers. It was any child that wanted to come and, and be blessed, any parent that wanted to dedicate their child to the Lord, whether they were a member of the church or not, um, they were invited to come bring uh, their child. And as you could see from Sunday's service, there was plenty of young children that were not part of Macedonia that came in and wanted to be blessed. And they have visited over the, you know, past couple months. And these children asked their parents, you know, can we be blessed? You know, when, when the, when the blessing and the dedication comes, can we participate in this? And it was just a blessing to see these young people come to the altar just the way they are. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, for fanfare. It's, they just came with their hearts and it was beautiful. Then we topped off the day with our end of summer, back to school, baptismal dedication, picnic party celebration. It was wonderful. Um, it was beautiful to be together with the saints and all the friends and our families. Everyone was there. Um, we had some awesome food trucks and I'll give them a shout out. We had um, Luis from 900 Degrees, um, his food truck where his food just does not stop coming. Until we're full, he does not stop coming. And then we had Tony from Tony Delicias, um, his taco truck, food was amazing, just just fantastic, just, just perfection. And then we had the Sono ice cream truck where you could have as much ice cream as you wanted. And then um, for the young ones, but I have to say there was quite a few adults in there. We had the bouncy house and the, um, the we had two bouncy houses. So one of them was like a, um, a course you can go through. And then the other one was, you know, just plain old bouncing and the children and the adults enjoyed it, enjoyed it very much. So it was a fantastic weekend and um, we're just going higher. You know, the unity is just getting greater and greater. Uh, Pastor B is taking us in and we're just following closely behind. We're praying and we're just believing God for everything that Elder Stevens, our visionary, has put into Macedonia that it's now coming to fruition. So it was a wonderful weekend and we'll have many, many more like that. So that was just a little recap, small talk about our weekend and how awesome it was. Oh, and how can I forget the great news that we heard this weekend that there'll be another Davis joining the ministry. Um, Pastor B and Sister Amanda are welcoming their first child in March. So that was just an awesome surprise and blessing and just wonderful. Just, a, just wonderful news all the way around. No bad news. That's our motto for the rest of the year. No bad news. All is well. So we're gonna get into having our little fun time now. So we get people um, talking and getting in the, the mode of wanting to share. So we have our little uh, icebreaker. And this one, um, someone gave to me the idea and I thought it was so good. And it gave me like, I kept thinking, it had me thinking about what I would do. So I'm gonna put it up on the screen. And this is something that would like you would play. I don't know if you did it as children, but we always did it. And and believe it or not, we still do it nowadays at family things. You know, would you rather, you know, would you rather get eaten by an alligator or by a shark? So this is one of those types of would you rather, but they're biblical. 
So we're going to, we're going to try to do as many as we can. And hopefully we'll get like, you know, a couple people for each one, you know, come on in and, and say what you would do, uh, which one you would rather and why. And if we make it brief, then we can get as many people as we can and get through as many of these as we can before we get into our lesson. Okay. So would you rather face Goliath with only a stone and a slingshot? Or would you rather wander in the desert for 40 years? Does anyone want to say what they would do? Would you rather face Goliath or wander in the desert for 40 years? Anyone want to take that one? They're on the screen. So if you look down and see one that you really want to answer, you can raise your hand and tell me. We could skip to that one ahead, whatever you guys want to do. Would you rather carry the Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan River, or would you rather carry Jesus's cross to Goliath, Golgotha, and why? What, what would you rather do? Let's see, Sister Nikki. Sister Annalisa, I'm gonna skip down to the very last one. And I would, if I have to choose, I would go with, see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead because both of them defy nature. But that I, I specifically love because this is where I believe we are right now where we're going to have miracle signs and wonders and because I love the, the science behind the medicine. So that's my reason. Okay. I like that. She'd rather see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead rather than seeing Jesus walk on the water. Okay, anyone have any other one they wanna say what you would rather? Would uh, Sister Alma. I'll start with the first one. I'd rather face Goliath with only a stone because no one likes waiting for something. And if you told up front that you gotta wait 40 years for something to happen, uh, that would really be, you know what I mean. But I'd rather choose the first one and get it over with. Yeah. Okay. Because it says face Goliath with only a stone and a slingshot. It doesn't say what would happen there, huh? But um, I get what you're saying about wandering in the desert for 40 years. And as soon as you said that, you said waiting for something for that long. And I just thought about how we're waiting on a promise. So you've had the patience, Sister Alma, and you've been waiting. So give yourself some credit there. Um, anyone else? Uh, Brother Curtis. Yeah, I would. Um, I would uh, carry the Jesus's cross uh, to Golgotha because I would love to be near God that gave His life for me, and just to feel the love and compassion that emanated from Him as He was going to the cross to suffer for my sin. Wow, that's awesome. There's no right or wrong for any of these. These are just what we would rather. Sister Shirley Stamron. Well, the one I'm gonna choose is um, be present at Jesus' birth or be present at his, resur uh, at his resurrection. Okay. Uh, oh, I would be at his resurrection. I would rather be at his resurrection because, um, you know, to see him, raised from the dead that would be glorious it would be awesome it would have been awesome to see him you know there knowing that he raised from the dead to see his hands and the nail prints and all you know i that's what i would write okay all right i think i'm with you on that one too sister gail all right hi you know me with baby so i would love to be present at his birth Oh, okay. Because just to know that, okay, it's here, it's done, and Jesus is here to save us and to, you know, all of that stuff. So I would, I would love to be present at his birth. Okay. All right. Does anyone want to, we'll take the next one and then we'll move on to a few more. Um, be in prison for over two years or be swallowed by a whale? That's a little tricky. I wouldn't want either, but Sister Mary. 
if I was to choose, it would be imprisoned for over two years because I do not want to be swallowed by a whale. I do not like water, scared of drowning and all that. That's that's the same thing I was thinking. I mean, I wouldn't want to be imprisoned for two years, but yeah. You know, and sometimes we play these games and um, sometimes you get the deep folk. Oh, God forbid. I don't want to say that because then what if it happens to me? It's just a game. We're just being silly and just playing a game here. So here's a few more. Um, we don't have to do all of them. If you look through them and you see one, um, would you rather, you know, would you rather have the strength of Samson or the wisdom of Solomon? Would you rather have a plague of locusts or a plague of frogs? Would you rather have dinner with Moses or dinner with Paul? Would you rather experience Pentecost or be with the disciples when Jesus appeared to them after the resurrection. Anyone think can want to add to any of these? Play along and say what you would rather. Oh, this is a good one. Would you rather know what type of fruit Adam and Eve ate? Or would you want to know what Jesus wrote in the sand when the people wanted to stone the woman who committed adultery? That's a good one. Sister Vicki. I'd want to know what Jesus wrote in the sand. Like that just like always drives me crazy. I'm like, I want to know what he wrote. And I guess we'll never find out until we get to heaven. But that's always been something I wanted to know. And as far as Adam and Eve and the, the fruit, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that one. Definitely. I've always been curious because um, a lot of people have said, you know, what they thought it was, but we really don't know. We don't know what fruit either, but, but I'm with you. It doesn't matter the fruit. We just know they disobeyed God. So um, how about see the burning bush talk to Moses or see the fire consume Elijah's altar in front of the prophets of Baal? On that one, I would probably say I'd want to see the burning bush. Definitely would want to see the burning bush. That would be something miraculous to see. All right, uh, Sister Sheree. The one that experienced Pentecost, I definitely want to experience Pentecost. I, I, I am definitely going with Pentecost with the fire. I want, I want it again. I want a baptism. I want another Pentecost. I want the tongues of fire. I want the cloven tongues. I want it all again. So that's wow. definitely that one. <laughs> all right. Okay. So I'm going to ask the last one. If anyone else doesn't doesn't want to answer, but we're going to. This is the last one I'll ask. Have God add 15 years to your life or be carried to heaven in a chariot of fire? Sister Gail. I would rather be carried to heaven in a chariot of fire. Yes, ma'am. Ah. I would say I was thinking that too because then I know I'm guaranteed to make it to heaven because you never know what happens in them 15 years. Okay, anyone else have anything they want to share before we move on and get into the lesson? Okay, all right. So we are talking about Josiah calling the people back to God. So today's aim, when a nation ignores the law of God, utter destruction is inevitable end. It is common knowledge today that for the most part, the mention of God has been taken out of our public school system. We are living in a secular society. Our lesson this week shows us the powerful way God can use one person who submits to his will in the midst of a disobedient people. So the facts of our lesson are to study how Josiah brought the law of God back into focus in the life of God's people. The principle is to show that one person's commitment to God can turn the tide of evil for a nation. And the application to our lives is to demonstrate that when we as Christians submit to the laws of God, we will find God's lessons. And then I've read something in the teacher's book that I thought was really powerful. Um, it was really powerful. And I just I just wanted to read this real quick before we get into the actual scripture lesson text, because it really stuck out to me. 
And it said, have you ever wondered where the downhill trend of discarding God from our society will ultimately end? Wondering where it'll end. How will it change our society? What effect will it have on our children and their generation? Will our children be able to worship the Lord without being persecuted? It is time we gave some thought to these very serious issues in our time. We also need to ask ourselves what witness God calls us to give in the midst of a crooked generation. So this week's lesson will show us how a young guy named Josiah with a heart for God brought the law of God back into focus for God's people. So we have an example to follow. So Josiah is one of those examples to follow. Despite his age, as we know in the lesson, he was he was young in age. And the scripture that they referenced for that was Philippians 2, 14 and 15. And that scripture says, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So we have to wonder, this will give us some thought throughout the lesson of what legacy we leave for our children. Um, what kind of world are we leaving and what, how one person can make a change. One person can make a change at their job, in school. So as we learn from this lesson, it doesn't matter your age, you can make a difference and it can start with one person. So we will get into our scripture lesson text. And at this time, I'm gonna ask Sister Nadine Carter to come on and read our scripture lesson text for us. Sister Nadine. Thank you, Annalisa. Second Kings 22 and eight. And Hilkiah the king, the high priest said unto Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he met, read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, the servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan, the scribe, shewed the king, saying, Hilkiah, the high priest, delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart, all their soul, to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. And the king commanded all the people saying, keep the pass over unto the Lord your God as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not, there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judge Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, where the Passover was holding to the Lord in Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reader and the hearing of his word. So with this lesson, there was a lot of reading, a lot of background reading. So you probably could have read all of 2 Kings 22, chapter 22, and 2 Kings chapter 23 uh, to get a full picture of Josiah. Um, so there was a lot of background reading and the related scriptures um, showed that. So they were covered in that area. And then we also had Numbers 9, 1 through 5, and 1 Kings 13, 1 through 10, which we'll touch on those later along with some of the questions. But it was a lot of background reading. Um, 
I won't be reading all of that today because it, it, like I said, it was a lot. So hopefully you were able to dig into that, but the lesson pretty much, we're gonna stick pretty much with the lesson text so that um, everyone could participate. We're gonna stick with the questions and right out of your book and the answers so that everyone, uh, no wrong answers, everyone can participate and feel free to chime in at any point. Okay, so the introduction to the lesson. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king in Jerusalem and he reigned for 55 years. He was very evil and profaned the holy land with idolatry and the shedding of innocent blood. His son Amon was no better. When he was assassinated, the people made Josiah king. Things now took a turn for the better. Josiah was only eight years old when he began to reign. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, despite his wicked predecessors and the fact that the law of Moses had been lost, this young king put himself on the road to righteousness. After God's law was found in the temple, it was read to Josiah. He sent a delegation to Huldah the prophetess and she sent God's message that he would live in peace. Josiah then brought about many reforms in the nation. So that like sums up um, a few chapters at once, but um, we'll get into them. Does anyone want to say anything at this point before we go any further? Anything you want to add about introducing the lesson? If there's something that we don't cover that you want to make sure we cover, just please, you know, let me know. Uh, Sister Kawana. Yeah, as you were reading that and just as I was reading the lesson, I was just thinking like how you said, um, you know, Josiah's grandfather and his father were both evil. It was just such a, a terrible time at the time. And for this young child to have such, you know, a different mindset um, and just a different way of doing things at just his young age. Um, I think it's, you know, a remarkable and it shows really the power of God because his environment did not, you know, support him, you know, having that kind of mindset. But, you know, when God is in, like God must have had a hold of him somehow and was able to work through him. So, you know, it just made me think like no matter your circumstance or your environment or kind of what you came from, you know, God can still use you. So that, that's kind of what I got out of that. Wow, that's powerful. And you're absolutely right. Just thinking of that, um, like you said, you know, his father was a wicked man. He, he could have blamed him being wicked on his father. So you're absolutely right. Sometimes we get stuck in, you know, well, that's how I was raised and this is what happened, but it doesn't have to be that way. When, when God really touches you and even at eight years old, like Josiah, God really touched him and he really loved God. And he, when he found God's laws, as we'll see, you know, he made a change, um, not only in himself, it first came to him. Um, as we go on reading, you'll see that. But, you know, just very powerful, Sister Kwana. Thank you for bringing that out. Um, you're never too young and you're never too old. So the lesson outline um, in 2 Kings 22, 8 through 10, and those verses is the discovery portion of the verses, the discovery of um, the documents. Um, in 2 Kings 23, 1 through 3 is the determination of bringing of what his purpose was of the documents. And then the devotion um, to start the Passover was 2 Kings 23, 21 through 23. And like I said, a lot of your information, a lot of our questions, you probably would have had to do a little more research and digging, but um, we will get into that. And okay, so let's do like a, a whole background on 2 Kings from chapter 20 to 22, really quick picking out just the meat parts. So talking about Hezekiah, Hezekiah was Josiah's great grandfather, but he never knew his great grandfather, but they were alike in many ways. Both had a close personal relationship with God. Both were passionate reformers, making valiant efforts to lead their people back to God. Both were bright flashes of obedience to God among kings, with darkened consciences who seem bent on outdoing each other in disobedience and evil. Over a 100 year period of Judah's history, Hezekiah was the only faithful king, but what a difference he made. 
Because of Hezekiah's faith and prayer, God healed him and saved his city from the Assyrians. Hezekiah had been a good and faithful king. Does anyone want to add anything else about Hezekiah that you might have found in your studies? Want to give any other information about Josiah's great grandfather, Hezekiah? Okay, so we will go, uh, Mother Millie. Hezekiah um, got sick and he put a, a resume in front of the Lord and told him, Lord, I've done A, B, and C. And the Lord healed him because of the, um, um, you know, the things that he did good for the Lord. Right. Yep. Thank you. So, and then there's another thing that I will bring out um, that it did slip my mind when um, Sister Kawana was talking about being, you know, a young child and serving Jesus. Josiah was only eight years old. And as an eight-year-old, you want to be able to do those fun things. And, um, you know, you have other things that you might want to do, the peer pressure. Imagine what an eight-year-old goes through nowadays. But if we compared Josiah and Jesus, we definitely would see a comparison there. Jesus was young and at the age of 12 started his ministry. And we think about how his parents forgot him at the temple, but you know, like he told them, he was about doing his father's business. But there's there's a comparison there between Jesus and Josiah. I didn't um, fully study it. It just it came upon, you know, when uh, like I said, like when Sister Kawana, it it sparked in my mind about the comparison of the two. So if anyone wanna wants to give any comparisons of the two, uh, you could feel free because they were both children starting out. And um, that's why we even did the dedication this weekend because God calls children and you you dedicate them to God. And you know, like the Bible says, you know, you raise them up right. And when they're when they're older, they won't forget their roots. They won't forget where they came from. They will come back. And as we could see, many have been coming back in the nest. Um, there have been many children that grew up in Macedonia that are now coming back. I won't name names because I wouldn't want to put anyone on the spot or embarrass anyone, but it's an awesome thing. And we're really rejoicing about that because that's God's promise. They're coming back for their inheritance. They put in time when they were growing up as well in shut-ins and prayers. So uh, God hears a child's prayer. So one by one, they're coming back. And I really believe that. Does anyone want to add anything to Hezekiah or Jesus and Josiah before we move forward? Before we go on to Manasseh, uh, Sister Alma. I was just getting another visual, you know, being an elementary teacher and Josiah was eight. So when you're eight, you're normally like third grade. So can you imagine a third grader being king? You're absolutely right. I, I couldn't imagine. I could not imagine. Sister Nikki. As I was listening to um, Sister Kawana, I was reminded of a dream that I shared with her. And I know Lillian, she's a praying warrior. She was over at my house, Kawana and, and all. And she has a beautiful spirit. And I know Sister Bernadette spoke about her, but uh, this little one, um, uh, Joshua, I could remember this is when the kids were like, like maybe no more than maybe one or two. And Matthew was still with Gaga Goo Goo. And I had a dream. Joshua, he was standing before the church and he was speaking like so eloquently. And if you have a conversation with him, even in during the, the kids Bible studies, you can hear Joshua. He's reciting all of the books. I mean, I think he knows more than I know of the books of the Bible. I mean, so these God wants to use our kids as sister Cherie had mentioned, um, on last weekend, he wants to use them because these kids are only like nine years old. And when I hear Josiah, you know, I think of Gracie and I see Josiah say, well, hello, King Josiah. So yes, I, God wants to use our kids. Definitely. Absolutely. He definitely wants to use our kids. And what a generation of young people we have coming up, you know, like Matthew and, you know, Josiah and Joshua. I mean, there's there's so many young people in the ministry that are coming up now under Pastor B that God is going to use them and they're not going to have to be, 
waiting until they're uh, young adults, maybe not even teenagers. God wants to use them now. And I believe, you know, like we heard on Friday night, the recipe for revival, we do as God commands us to do. Revival will come a lot sooner and our children will be out there and they won't have to go through a lot of the things that we went through. Once revival comes, you know, we say it all the time, um, you know, we joke about it, you know, with little B and, and Ezra and Gia that they, they don't want them to go through the struggles they went through. They want Jesus to come back and revival to happen before they have to go through that. And it may sound silly, but sometimes when you really, you really love your children, you don't want to see them go through that. And I believe that, you know, in this time, the young people, sister Nikki, I believe they will be used by God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So let's move on to Manasseh. Um, Manasseh was Josiah's grandfather, and he followed the example of his grandfather, Ahaz, more than his own father, Hezekiah. He adopted the wicked practices of the Babylonians and Canaanites, including sacrificing his own son. He did not listen to the words of God's prophets, but he willfully led the people into sin. So Manasseh was an evil king, and he angered God with his sin. Does anyone have anything else they want to share about Manasseh that they might have studied? What are some of the things that they might have brought as um, idols? Does anyone, did anyone go through any of that with these kings, these wicked kings brought as idols that Josiah is now having to clear up? We will touch on it later, but if you wanted to talk about it now, that's fine. Okay, so we'll move on to Ammon. Now, Ammon was Josiah's father. Uh, Sister Mary. Um, I read that Manasseh had made it a point to um, rebuild the pagan shrines that it, his father had built. So he made it his mission to rebuild all those idolatry, you know, worship, the shrines, the the things that Josiah would, the altars that Josiah, Josiah would bring down. And also Manasseh was, um, he was only 12 years old when he began I think you said that when he began to reign, he was only 12 too. So all these Kings we're looking at, they're all young people. Right. You're right. I did. I did forget to mention that he was 12. Uh, Brother Curtis. Yeah. Baal was the, um, the goddess or the God that represented the bull. He represented strength. Asherah was his wife. Um, she represented you know his mistress and she also had um homosexuality went with it war and also um sexual acts that's what they did um to worship and josiah went and you know he broke down all those idols and stuff grinded them the power they had the astral poles they used to dance around and they had the groves which they used to worship on mm -hmm. exactly Exactly. Anyone else want to add anything? Uh, Sister Mary. And also he actually, um, he brought these evil altars into the house of the Lord. So he went overboard. He didn't just, you know, they weren't just outside of the temple, but he brought them into the courts of the temple. Exactly. Yep. Uh, Brother Isaac. Um, but at the end, Manessa did repent, though, at the end. Okay. Correct? Um, don't put me on the spot, Brother Isaac. <laughs> he did. I think Second Kings, I think Second King 20 and 22. I think, yeah, he did repent at the end. Okay. He said, Lord, don't, um, but, uh, you know, destroy my sins, but don't destroy me. Okay. What was the scripture again you said? Second Kings. 20 and 22. Okay. That's what I thought you said. Okay. All right. Um, Pastor B. Yeah, I was just going to help Isaac out. Um, he's 100% right. Manasseh did turn back to God. And it's also in Second um, Chronicles 30, uh, 33, 1 through 10. So he did, he did turn it around um, after all the evil he did, cause he was one of the most evil Kings, but then he actually did repent of his way. So Isaac was right about that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, usually when you're studying something, you try to focus on the one thing because you could get overloaded 
Um, let's hear from Elder Purdue. Uh, yes, and at least I was thinking, even though people repent, but you set a world of fire to the rest of the world while you in heaven, but everybody else is still fighting that same spirit. Let's look at the lady who took prayer out. They said she got saved. Now we're fighting to get prayer back in. So you got to watch when you start something because it can start a world of fire too if you're not careful. Wow. Wow. Uh, Brother Curtis? Yeah, just one more thing I wanted to add to that. Um, there was a man of God that prophesied about Josiah 300 years before Josiah was born. But the man of God, he went to the altar and he cried out, oh, altar, oh, altar. And he cried out about all the sins that were going to be committed upon the altar. So Josiah came and he took all of those idols and stuff like that, ground on them powder, uh, straw, dead men's bones on it, and all the different things he did to cleanse the temple. But it was prophesied 300 years in advance what he was going to do. That's why the significance of the altar. Exactly. And I believe that's 1 Kings 13, 1 through 10. That's one of our related yeah. scriptures. Thank you for bringing yeah. that up. Okay. Um, anyone else? Uh, Brother Isaac. I was just curious. It's like God, for all the sin that Manasseh committed, God forgave him. But then when Josiah, you know, all the thing that he, the good that he did, God said he still wouldn't forgive, you know, all the sins that Israel committed. He still would judge Israel. Right. He, he did say that to Josiah, but he also told Josiah that he wouldn't have to see it. It wouldn't happen in his reign. So, um, and then we'll also see, you know, we don't really touch it in this lesson. It just mentions it in your lesson about um, how he, his rule ended abruptly for not um, being obedient and he was killed in battle. But let's move on to Amon, Josiah's father. Now, um, as someone mentioned, the young, um, Manasseh being 12, Josiah 8. Ammon was 22 years old when he began to reign. That's still young. And he reigned two years in Jerusalem. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did his father Manasseh. He followed his father's ways, served idols, and worshiped the same ones that his father did. He forsook the God of his fathers and walked not in the ways of the Lord. The servants of Ammon conspired against him and slew him in his own house. The people of the land then slew those that had conspired against Ammon. So then the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. So that brings us to our lesson and where we are today. So we're going to just touch um, Josiah, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 22. We're going to read 1 through 7 which would talk about Josiah and how he became king. He was eight years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah from Bozkath. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor, David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent Shaphan, son of Isaiah, the grandson, of Meshalam, the court secretary to the temple of the Lord. He told him, go to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him count the money the gatekeepers have collected from the people at the Lord's temple. Entrust this money to the men assigned to supervise the restoration of the Lord's temple. Then they can use it to pay workers to repair the temple. They will need to hire carpenters, builders, and masons also have them buy the timber and the finished stone needed to repair the temple, but don't require the construction supervisors to keep the account of the money they receive, for they are honest and trustworthy men. So we wanted to give a little background about Josiah and where it shows in 2 Kings, the beginning of 22, where he becomes king. I saw someone's hand. Do you want to share? I believe it was Patrick. Did you want to? Patrick, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. No, it was a mistake. I okay. No problem. Okay. Um, Elder Stanrod. 
Yeah, what what I wanted to say, um, I think Sister Kawana alluded to it also, but um, you look at Josiah and the evil influence, you know, from his father, his grandfather, but the, the Bible, what it said, he did, you know, that which was right according to David. Mm -hmm. So, you know, God handles upon him because the prophetic word had gone for years ago, called him by name and everything. And when God hand is on you, you don't matter if you're in the drug house. You know, I heard Sister Gail's testimony like in her early years when she was saved and the environment that she was in, but God kept her. So it let me know in spite of the evil influence that he had, there was probably something about the Psalms of David or the exploits or David would, would exalt the Lord, the success of David, the victories he had, that this man, you know, wanted to be patterned after David. And, you know, he, 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 he followed David example, that was, which was such a good thing because there was many evil kings, like you were saying, but David's legacy and testimony touched this man that God was able to use him as a reformer, even at a young age. That's right. Yeah, that stuck out to me too, because being who his father was, um, not a good king, that he followed the example of David. And that that stuck out to me because like we said earlier, it doesn't have to be an excuse by who raised you. We don't have to say, um, I was used to this and this is what I was subjected to. You can look on and find someone else to pattern your life after. Uh, the Bible says to mark the perfect and upright man. So there is someone that we can follow after, and that is Jesus, if we can't find a, um, an earthly person to follow. Okay, so here are just some um, random facts about Josiah from the lesson. Um, he was remembered as Judah's most obedient king. He recognized sin, even as a young age, at eight years old, he recognized what sin was, and he eliminated sinful practices, as we heard, you know, uh, breaking down um tabernacles and such he attacked the causes of sin so he went after those that brought sin into their to the land and he was the 18th king of judah and he ruled the southern kingdom he was appointed king at the age of eight years old and he sought after god and was open to him he was a reformer like his great grandfather hezekiah and he cleaned out the temple and revived obedience to god's laws does anyone have anything else about Josiah that you want to add? Mother Millie. Anna, in 2 Kings 23 and 10, he defiled the people that would pass their sons or daughter in the fire. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, anyone else? Oh, Sister Mary, I'm sorry. He was also there. Uh, Judah's last hope before they were taken into captivity. I mean, you know, just he was like the, like the last good king, although they were going into captivity anyway, but at least they had a light. You know, he's the one who brought revival. And then after that, it was downhill and they went into captivity. Yes. Um, Sister Alma. I wanted to share uh, the scripture that goes with him being the most obedient king. It's in 2 Kings 23 and verse 25. It said, and like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. Amen. That's a great first Kings 23 and 25 is what sister Alma just read. Um, anyone else? And we can get into the questions and sister Vicki. I just wanted to kind of make a comment. Um, I just think this lesson's like really timely with what pastor B had mentioned on Friday. One thing I took away was like the reverence of the Lord being brought back into the temple. So I don't think it's by accident how it kind of like correlates. I just wanted to mention that how like um, King Josiah is bringing, you know, with all the actions that he did, it's obviously bringing the reverence of God and, you know, God back into the temple. So although it's not the same exact context, I just, um, I just thought I'd mention that if that makes sense. <laughs> no, it makes sense. And, um, I was thinking, reading this lesson, I was also thinking about Friday's message uh, when we talked about where how we always say it, and and I've I've been guilty of saying it too about Christians not getting involved in politics, um, and saying that I think we kind of got to clear that a little. Yeah, I'm not going to debate politics. I'm not a political person at all. 
Um, I, you know, I do believe in keeping that to yourself. And when we were younger, my parents wouldn't even say if they were, I don't even know if they were Republican or Democrat. I don't even know. To this day, I don't know. Um, there's just certain things we didn't discuss. But um, going back to Friday's message where Pastor B, he mentioned that there is a way to do it. And then our lesson brought it out and it said, Christians have often been told not to become involved in politics. However, that opinion has seemingly undergone a change. Decent, God-fearing, Bible-believing, church-going people can make a difference in national life. So we see in our lesson, because Josiah didn't shy away from that. He took a whole nation and was able to turn them before they went into captivity, as Sister Mary said. Sister Nikki. I agree with Sister um, Vicky Victoria, because I also thought about the recipe for revival, um, Pastor Brandon's message on Friday as I was studying this lesson. And I kind of saw like um, Pastor Brandon as like King Josiah and then how he had, you know, with his heart being so pure towards the people and the word of God, but also his stand that he has taken and calling everybody, you know, to kind of go higher as well as, um, the apostle of revival i saw when he had come in and he asked everybody okay who is a member here and he stood us up and he said you all gave your word that you know it, it just put me in that same mindset that we would stand with you know um pastor brandon and be that armor bearer so i i, I completely agree with um victoria this is a timely message I agree as well. Definitely very timely. Um, where we are right now um, in the nation and everything, you know, I believe I mentioned that before. I do believe it's very timely. And I just pray that, you know, when we when we study the word and I say it for myself, I'm always like, I don't want to just read and I, I want to change. I want it to ignite something in me to change. I want to, I want to be a reformer. I want to be able to I'm not, you know, I might not be able to, I won't be on this, I won't be on the same magnitude as like a Josiah, but we can start in a little corner somewhere. And that, that means something. If all of us do a little bit, then it really brings forth a change. And right now it's really important. So as we, you know, we read second Chronicles seven and 14, we have to pray. And the most important thing to the end of that scripture was turning away from our sin, because that's what leaves the biggest testimony is that we walked away from it. We spoke about David and how Josiah looked towards David. David was not a perfect man, but he was a man after God's own heart. We know what David did and the mistakes he made, but for Josiah to still say he was an example to him says a lot because David turned away. So it's very important that, yeah, we can pray, we could seek his face, but that turning, I loved that part when he said that in Friday's message, that really stuck with me. It's the turning that makes the biggest difference. So he said we could do all of that, but not turn, and it won't mean anything. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Mother Millie. Anna, I just wanted to mention that when Pastor B talked about that I'm on the medication so I can't fast, that just, it, it, it I said, oh, ouch, because all I need to do is just take a slice of bread. I don't have to have a meal because I'm on medication. Amen. Well, you have to do whatever the Lord tells you to do. And um, as we always were told, use wisdom, you know, definitely use wisdom with that. And you could always run that by Pastor B. Um, but definitely there are ways to, you know, work around our illnesses. So we're going to go into question one and we're going to, we're going to like go verse by verse. We're going to break it down. Um, we're going to talk about the recovery. And that's Second Kings 22 and 8. And it's Hilkiah discovers God's law. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan and he read it. So who found the book of the law in, um, of God in the temple? Who found the book of the law of God in the temple? That's question one right out of your book. Who found the book? Uh, Sister Purdue. Uh, you have to unmute. Oh, okay. yes. I, I don't know if I pronounced the name correctly. Hi, um, Hi, Kim? No, I'm not pronouncing oh. it right. 
Hilkiah? Uh, Hilkiah? Yes, he found the book uh, while he was, um, you know, after while they were recovering up, while they were doing repairs at the church in the temple, he found the book and he turned it over to the priest. That's right. So it was Hokiah who found the book. Does anyone know or did any study? What do you think? What books were believed to be in the scroll? What books? Um, Sister Alma. I think I read they may have thought it was Deuteronomy, which was the fifth book, I think, in the Pentateuch, um, if that's how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what I that's what I read as well in a couple uh, commentaries. They were saying they believed it was Deuteronomy. Um, they were saying it could have been the first five. If anyone has any other thoughts or anything else they might have read differently, um, uh, Brother Curtis. Yeah, they said it also might be the Pentateuch, the four books that Moses wrote: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those five uh, books of the law. Okay. All right. Anyone else have anything that they read? So basically, the, the one of the commentaries, as Sister Alma said, many scholars think this was Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Pentateuch. Um, okay. So let's go on to question number two. And this is verse nine, where Shapan reports to Josiah. Shapan went to the king and reported, your officials have turned over the money collected at the temple of the Lord to the workers and supervisors at the temple. So how was King Josiah notified of the law scrolls discovery? Sister Linda. Shapan went to him and told him that the king's servants had gathered the money in the temple. And then while he was telling him that, then he showed him the, the scroll. That's that right. Peace has signed. Exactly. So, what do you? Um, what did King Josiah want to do with the money collected? So, when we were um, talking about how he wanted um, the money from the temple collected, do you know what he wanted to do with the money? Does anyone? Does anyone remember or read that when you were studying what he wanted to do with the money that was collected? It would bring why uh, Shapan was there, Sister Jolene. Um, I think because he wanted to rebuild the temple, it must have been in bad shape and he wanted to have money to pay the workers. Yep. And all the supplies and the workers and Josiah really wasn't concerned with uh, keeping account of what the money was because he said those were honest and hardworking men. So he trusted what they were doing. So does anyone know what is a scribe? When we talk about a scribe, and we talk about Shapan as being a scribe. Does anyone know what a scribe is in the Bible? Uh, Sister Alma. A scribe is, he's the writer of the law and like a record keeper. So there, and I also, you know, in this lesson, not only did he, you know, was responsible for writing the law, but he read it aloud later on. Mm-hmm. That's right. Anyone else? I saw another hand, but I didn't catch who it was. Anyone else want to add to that? So the Merriam Webster's dictionary said that they ascribe as a member of a learned class in ancient Israel through New Testament times studying the scriptures and serving as copyists, editors, teachers, and jurists. And they are an official or public secretary or clerk. So I guess it would be a nowadays as a um, an administrative person because I don't think we're allowed to call sec secretary secretaries anymore. They're administrative assistants. So that's what a scribe is, and it's a very important position. Um, not just to read. It's it's like they said. It's a learned class of people. It's very important to be able to um, read, and it's an uh, it's actually an honor to be able to say, you know, the king has me reading, and so. I definitely believe that as well, that it's definitely a position that you can find honor in. Okay, so verse 10, uh, Sister Mary. I'm sorry, I wanted to say something about the, um, just the way they found that book. Sure. I, I think it, it seemed like God's providence because um, Josiah had, the king had asked, um, he had asked 
the scribe to go find out, you know, to go tell the high priest to get a reckoning of everything and, you know, give the money to the people to rebuild the temple. And then they were just happened to be cleaning up and then they found, he found that book. So had they not, had the king not asked for that, they would never, I don't know when they would have found that book of the law. So it was just um, good timing for them to find that book and read it and everything. So I just thought God was behind all of that. It wasn't just by accident. That's right. And then also like it shows how depraved they were and how far they've come from God to just misplace, you know, just lose or misplace or just shelf the, the law of God and just to feel that it's not that important to read anymore, the law of Moses. And, you know, they just haphazardly put it anywhere. And so he came upon it, you know, like, like as sister Mary said, they came upon it and, um, it, they weren't looking for it. So that's, that's definitely divine intervention, which I think is pretty remarkable that, cause you know, it said like matter of fact, it said Shapan made a matter of fact report that he found the money. And then by the way, I found the law of Moses. I found the scroll. So it, you know, that I believe what you're saying, definitely, you know, divine intervention. So, um, Elder Stamron. No, I was saying also it shows why, you know, they were in the condition they were before, because if the law is not being taught and the leaders who were leading uh, as kings didn't um, provide the guidance from God's word and his laws, then men are going to be even wicked and they're going to want to serve somebody. And definitely it wasn't God because they're bound in the Lord, but he just showed when he wanted to repair the temple, his intent was, he knew the secret that, you know, if you get the temple up and people start going back to church, and singing after the Lord, then, you know, it will change the whole nation. So he was on the right track and God, like you said, have it so fixed that, you know, they found the Lord that was in, in the temple. So God is awesome. Sister Kawana. And to add to that, I think about this is so applicable even to today and why we need to pray for revival because much like, you know, them back then, they, you know, they, they, they lost, you know, they lost the scriptures, they lost the scroll you know, we, this nation was founded on Christianity. This nation was founded with God, but over the years we've lost it. We've lost it. We've lost it. And with all the leaders not upholding anything we've lost, you know, we've, we've lost kind of where we started and we've lost, you know, that kind of foundation. Um, so that's why, you know, I think it, it's so applicable for today and where we are and just like, you know, it lends itself to praying for revival, um, that we need that leader to come in and kind of find the scrolls for us, you know, in, in our nation today. I like that. Elder Purdue? Uh, yes, and also I was thinking about in China, how they're taking our book and adding stuff to mess the word up. So they're losing to have a book, but they're not really getting the full truth of the gospel. So we really have to pray for those in China that want the truth because the country has made Bibles of themselves and what they want to do about our book. Um, Elder Purdue, it's funny because I was thinking the same thing. Um, instead of using the original that we have places like, I know there's there, they have a lot of Bibles that are coming out for different, um, genders and, you know, the LBGTQ, I don't know, I, I don't want to mess that up, but they, they have their own Bible coming out and, um, different things. But the, the real scroll, the real Bible, like sister Kawana said, we need someone to find that one and bring it back, you know bring it back to the to the White House and say, this is what America was founded on. And this is what we're gonna go back to instead of all these copycats and those poor people in China. And I was reading somewhere, there is actually, I think there's an app on our phone that if you, they are actually taking out, if you're going from the King, King James to NIV or the other different versions, they're actually taking whole meanings out and whole verses. And it's it's pretty sad that, you know, we just have to be careful what we're reading and how we're reading it because you don't want to be fooled. And it's important to not eat at so many tables because you will get confused. So to stick with the real true word of God and a good con commentary and concordance that that's what keeps us staying straight in the word of God instead of jumping all over the place. Um, anyone else before we move on to question number three? So question three, says, why did Josiah send a delegation 
to Huldah the prophetess. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. So Shaphan read it to the king. So why did Josiah, this, this is where the little background reading had to come in. Why did he send a delegation to Huldah the prophetess? And what did Huldah prophesy? That's question number three. Sister Shirley Stamron. Well, it says that um, basically King sent the delegation to Huldah, the high priest, um, yeah, to find out what God had to say about this with the, the word and, you know, what God had to say about this and the, the things that were written in the scroll that they found. They wanted to know, you know, how God felt about it. And so Huldah, the prophetess, prophesied that God was getting ready to send judgment on on the people because of their the wickedness that they have wrought god was getting ready to send judgment on them but um i don't know if i should say um you can go ahead go ahead yeah but because um josiah had set his heart towards god he was not going to be around when the when the judgment came but he god definitely was going to send judgment that's right elder purdue you want to add to that uh, yes, I was just thinking about what he used. He used a woman. And there's always this controversy about women in the church. That's right. And that's that's kind of like where this is the last um, lesson in our quarter. And our quarter um, for this summer has been God's work through women and young people. So we had a lot of women we read about, uh, just a few, like we read about Eve and Deborah, Ruth, Hannah, Esther, and then we had the young men, David and Josiah, you know, just to name a few. So God can use anyone. And this is what we talked about, how he used women throughout and um, how he used, used Holda. And she was very respected from what I was reading. They, they respected her and they believed that she was a true prophetess. And as we see the words that she gave us, Sister Shirley said that he would die, you know, but he wouldn't see the judgment of Judah while he was alive. So, I mean, she was a right, you know, right now prophetess. Um, anyone want to add? Uh, Sister Mary. Yeah, I also found it very interesting that they went to Hulda because I was reading that um, Jeremiah was a contemporary Mm -hmm. In Jeremiah 1, it said that he prophesied during the reign of Josiah. So I, I was wondering, why didn't he go to Jeremiah? But, um, you know, it, God has many prophets, prophetesses. So we see that he can use anyone. That's right. Elder Purdue? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brother Curtis? Yeah, also, um, along with what everybody else said. Is it down? When they, when they sent, when they sent um, word sent to Holder, um, Holder had the mind of God, and she knew what the will of God was. Though the whole uh, nation of Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, and Judah were backslidden, she had a relationship with God, and God spoke to her that she might speak to the people of the nation and call them back to repentance for the sin that they were committing. And this is powerful because, yeah, even once again, like I said with the church, God chooses who he wants to choose at the particular time and to those that are going to be obedient unto his will. And it's the same thing that's happening right now in our church. Uh, God is using a lot of the women, teachers, you and Sister Mary and Sister Bernadette and, you know, the different ones. Um, at this time the women he's using the women but you know this is god's will and this is what god wants to do and he could do whatever he want to do amen definitely um anyone else want to share before we go on okay so we're going to go on to questions four and five and this is where the covenant was read from second kings 23 1 and 2 then the king summoned all of the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets. 
all the people from the least to the greatest. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. So question four, what was Josiah's first act as he sought revival for the nation? What was his first act as he sought revival for the nation? Brother Curtis? Anyone want to take question number four right out of your book? We're talking about the covenant being read. Sister Alma? The first thing he did, he called a great convocation where he ordered um, the elders to meet him in the capital. And then anyone else who wanted to meet the priests, the prophets, they also came before him. Mm -hmm. um, and who, Sister Alma, since you're there, uh, question number five, it just continues on. Who else joined them, the elders and all the priests and prophets? He went to the uh, Mother Millie. Yeah, I was going to say that he went to the people. Mm -hmm. They were joined in the inhabitants and everybody, the people, they were all there. Okay, and that's what I was, um, when I was reading this, it was talking about how many people it could have been. And, and excuse me, as they were reading everything and how everyone could hear in such a great, you know, crowd of people how they can hear. So it was kind of breaking that down because um, they were saying they didn't know how many people were there, but to be able to hear is pretty impressive. So they might've had people strategically placed along different routes where they would hear something when, when Josiah would talk, he would speak, it would go down the line, like somebody maybe three miles down the road would be able to repeat it and so on and so on. So it's pretty amazing that they got the point across that these people wanted to hear and they got in line and they made sure everyone was able to hear what Josiah had to say and reading the book of the covenant. So that was really powerful to me. Sister Nikki. Just to add to Sister Alma's um, statement, uh, the book said that this time of spiritual resurgence began with a great convocation. So I looked up the word um, resurgence and it is, as everyone had stated, an increase or revival, which is what we're praying, catch my leader up after a period of little activity, um, popularity or occurrence. But while I was studying this lesson, I just wanted to add too, like this definitely is the time for the catching up um sister annalisa and i just thought as the people were working or the people were busy you know it was when god drew them back during this time so i believe like pastor brandon had mentioned like they're coming back for their inheritance you know they're coming in to receive what god has for them and that is what revival is about it's so that those you know, can be put on fire. You know, again, we can all go forth, you know, with the word of God, with miracle signs and wonders. And he gave us the recipe for revival. So it, he He actually just, you know, um, provoked the people to be on fire for God as, as Pastor Brandon did on Friday and always. Amen. Thank you, Sister Nikki. And that goes where um, Sister Mary was talking about how this was the last the resurgence was the last like little, if you want to say revival before they went into captivity again. So um, it was like the last little stretch of freedom and before they went in to um, the Babylonian captivity. Uh, Brother Curtis? Yeah, I was just going to say with that, um, I was trying to figure that out too, how he spoke to all these tens of thousands of people, you know, and they didn't have microphones and the whole set of this stuff like that. So I'm glad that you, you know, you opened that up to me because now I got a greater understanding of how it happened. Uh, another thing along with that is at the reading of the covenant, they uh, repented and you have the king near and you have all the officials, you have the elders and you have all the people of the whole nation repenting before God for their sins. That in itself is a revival. 
wow. because everybody was repenting from the um from the greatest to the smallest like they said the biggest the smallest the whole nation was repenting and that's the same word that came on friday you know if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray see my face turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven and heal the whole land so when we uh take the recipe of revival and apply it to where we're at right now we're going to see that there's going to be a whole national revival as well as the revival worldwide that's right I believe that and definitely, and we will have microphones and be, you know, we'll use all the technology of the modern day and we'd be able to hear it. But um, yeah, definitely, definitely. That's just awesome. So we can move on if anyone wants to, we have question six, seven, eight, and this is talking about the covenant made, second uh, Kings 23 and three. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commandments, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll, and all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. So number six, question number six, what promise did Josiah made after reading the law to the people? Sister Linda. He promised to um, walk in his ways and to keep all of his laws, keep all of God's laws. That's right. Sister Purdue, do you want to add to that? No? Okay. So um, as we were saying I'm early. I'm oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I had that didn't mute. I, I didn't unmute. Yes, pretty much what Sister Aunt, um, Linda said that they promised uh, to keep God's covenant and to agree um, to to stand with Him. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm throwing this off. Wait, give me one second here. Oh, okay. He promised to walk with Him, the ways to keep the Lord. Yes, and He intended to do this with His whole heart and soul. So He made a, a vow to do it from whole from His heart and just to be obedient to God. That's right. Um, Brother Curtis? Yeah, I'm not going to say anything more. But this reminded me of the promise that we made with Elder. Um, you know, as long as my soul liveth and the Lord liveth, I will not leave you. So we made that proclamation when we joined in to revival. And then we made the proclamation again at the ordination of Pastor B. that we said that we will follow him as he follows Christ, which had to be reiterated once again when the pastor came and told us about being faithful and believing. So this particular principle right here is very applicable for the time again, because you know, when God speaks things over and over and over again, he's trying to get that across in our minds and in our hearts so we don't forget it. That's right, amen. Um, there was two, um, two parts of this when Josiah read the book of the law. When he read this, he did two things with this. He pledged himself. He put himself first that he was going to keep all the commands and the laws. He made that decree first for himself. And then he said that the kingdom would do the same as well, that all the people would have to fall in line with that as well. So how did the congregation show their assent to the decision made by Josiah? Question number seven, how did the congregation show their assent to the decision made by Josiah? Question number seven, okay. So they stood to show they agreed with him and had the same desire to keep the covenant. Sister Alma. That word stood, stood out to me because I was picturing that he could have just been sitting up there on his throne, but it said that he stood with them. I'm thinking that maybe that was like an act of humility for him to stand with the people and not just be sitting up there on the throne. Mm -hmm. That's right. Brother Curtis. Okay. So, um, 
it says here that they stood to show they agreed with him and they had the same desire to keep the covenant. So it's like when we're in service and we agree with something that the preacher is saying, we stand up, we clap our hands, we give an applause, uh, we lift our hands. That's that's a way to an affirmation to say, I believe what you're saying and I'm with you and I agree with you. So um, then it said it said in our the teacher's book, I don't know if it says it in, in the other book, but it says here the custom of standing to show approval of what is happening on stage, it still pers persists. Although people most often use applause to express satisfaction, and some in the audience may even cheer whenever a performance is especially noteworthy, it's rewarded with a standing ovation. So if you wanna say they stood and gave a standing ovation to the law that was read, that Josiah read to them, um, it was also standard and um, standing was a, customary as a form of respect or etiquette in certain situations. Um, so, and we see that today when you go into a courtroom, you have to stand. Um, when the bride comes down the aisle, they said you have to stand. So it's a lot of it is etiquette and customary, but like Sister Alma said, that they, they stood, it was definitely something to stand out that they showed in agreement with them. So what types of reforms did Josiah make following his commitment to the covenant? So this is where we can talk about what he destroyed, what, what parts of the temples and idols he destroyed. Sister Linda. Um, once everyone stood with him, he made a promise um, to destroy the pagan shrines. He brought an end to the work of the idolatrous priests the heathen altars that were built by Solomon were destroyed and members of occult groups were put away um, along with anything else that was abominable. That's right. So basically that comes from 2 Kings 23, 4 through 24. Um, all the things that all the things that he did, he removed um, articles that were used to worship Baal, Ashtoreth, and all the powers of the heavens. He did away with idolatrous priests who had been appointed by previous kings of Judah, for any of them that offered sacrifices for pagans at the shrines throughout Judah, even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And when they talked about being, he did away, it could have been any, it could have been, you know, uh, you know, put them out of the city or it could have been execution. It doesn't really state which was which, but, um, they, they, anyone that offered sacrifices to Baal, to the sun, the moon, the constellations, he removed um, the Astra pole, as it was mentioned earlier, where people were um, worshiping the pole of Astra. Uh, and then he also took it outside Jerusalem. And then that's where it goes back to what we were saying about how it was prophesied what Josiah would do 300 years before Josiah came on the scene. It talked about him um, burning all of this on the altar. And that's what Josiah did. He took all of this. So like I said, if you, everything that he did, the re reformation that he did, it's all in second Kings 23, four through 24. And then in verse 25 is what Alma brought out before how God said, what a great King Josiah was. And, um, there was no King like him. Okay. So we'll go on to question number nine. So we don't run out of time. Now we're getting into the Passover. So Josiah celebrates Passover. King Josiah then issued the order to all the people, you must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as required in this book of the covenant. So why was the reinstitution of the Passover so important? Why was it so important? What was the Passover? Does anyone wanna start there and tell us? what the Passover was? Um, Elder Stamron. Of course, um, we read the Passover was when um, the children of Israel were in Egypt and the death angel was coming through. So they told them to put blood on the doorposts that when the angel of death come to slay the firstborn of the Egyptians, that they would be spared. So it symbolizes that the mercy of God and blood was applied to spare them 
And um, one of the questions you asked, why was this important? Because with this reform, if you take away something, then you have to replace it. And if they just, you know, put on the, the altars and everything and they leave them without replacing it, then it's a chance that they probably will go back because there's a, something human you always want to worship. And they probably will come up with some other form of God. So right away when they begin to institute the Passover, they were bringing them back to how they began, you know, the blood and the sacrifice, you know, they came out of Egypt to turn them back to the Lord. That's right. Um, Sister Nikki. Um, as um, Elder Sanrad had mentioned, the lesson says that um, the Passover commemorated God's deliverance of Israel from bondage in the lands of Egypt. And today, if we apply this to our time there is no remission or no atonement you know of sin without blood so without that that passover lamb jesus mm -hmm. okay anyone else want to add anything about the passover sister jolene uh, well moses had commanded that they keep the passover at the first month the 14th day of the first month and if they're going to return to the Lord, they need to return to remembering what the Lord did for them. And Passover was so important that, that, that they were God's people and to remember the feast. And one of the most important feasts was the Passover. That's right. They had three feasts every year and they were very important. And, and Moses wanted them to be able to, he, like you said, they, they definitely, we're supposed to, it was the feast. I'm sorry, I was looking. Okay, so it was um, the seven day feast of unleavened bread. The entire eight day festival eventually became known as the Passover. So it was also with the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost. The Feast of Tabernacles was a pilgrim, pilgrimage festival. And um, so these three feasts were to be celebrated. Now, what Josiah did was he said, you must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as required in this book of the covenant. So like Sister Jolene said, he went back to and stating it and you must do it. So it was very important that uh, they went back as Elder Stanrod said, you take away something, you wanna be able to replace it with something because it's natural for someone to wanna worship something or celebrate. So question number 10 um, is talking about the Passover held. So it's talking about the greatest celebration there had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years, the kings of Israel and Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. What kind of legacy did Josiah leave behind him? What kind of legacy did he leave behind him? Uh, Sister Shirley. It says that um, Josiah reign was like unlike was unlike anything that they had ever seen since the time of the judges. And then it was he was declared to be a better king than any before him or after him when he came to devotion of the Lord God that was given to Israel. So he was he was awesome. Wow, that's yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So then um, coming from the book, it said that we would do well to leave a similar legacy behind us. We are often concerned about the material things our children will inherit from us. Sometimes we are equally concerned about how to pass on our reputation, position or power to our children. The greatest gift we can leave behind is that of a life devoted to God and his kingdom. Conferring such a legacy actually begins before our children are born or in the case of other family members and friends before our initial contact with them. So it's very important that we leave behind that type of legacy to our children, our family and our friends, even before ones are even born as the as the lesson brought out. So in conclusion, from the very beginning of his reign, King Josiah wanted to follow what was right in God's sight. He had a tender heart for God. We must not get the idea that he had an easy time. 
Uh, I think we brought that out earlier. He didn't have an easy time, probably. He probably faced opposition from some people, but we see that he stood firm to the end and was known to be one of the righteous kings of Judah. God blessed everything he did. King Josiah also led his people down the pathway of righteousness as they sought to live by the book of the law that they had found. This applies even today. We are called to live by the Bible and therefore stay close to God's laws. We cannot go wrong when we do this, for it is God's truth for us today. Next week's lesson, we're talking about Daniel. It's a whole new um, chapter. We're talking about Daniel honors God's law. That's Daniel 1, 8 through 21. And we are going to pray that may the, the strength of God sustain us. May the power of God preserve us. May the hand of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. Move the love of God. May the love of God go with us this night and forever. Bless you all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night and God bless.